Father, thank you for your spirit. Thank you for being here, waiting on us, escorting us as we leave today, God. We owe everything to you. You owe us nothing. We come before you with a humble heart today, Lord, to just thank you for your goodness and your kindness. And as we go into this new year, Lord, I pray that, that we would be able to receive the blessings that you pour out on us and that they would manifest in lives that will be changed forevermore. Father, I thank you again for letting me be a part of your ministry. Father, help me today to make you happy that I am dictating what you want me to say. I want to hide behind you, Lord. Help me to become less so that you become more. And may your word settle on the hearts of your people and change their lives, especially mine. And I pray this in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, thank you, Marcus. Um, wow. I, thank you for the, the worship team. Amazing. Wow. You know, um, I had the honor of speaking at our men's retreat a few weeks ago. And I told a story at that gathering. And several men have come up to me since then and said, Pastor Ray, you need to share that story with the whole congregation. So I prayed about it, and God confirmed that it was something that he wanted the whole congregation. And, and especially when I realize how diverse our congregation is. You know, I, I can't remember what the number is, but if you guys look around, I think Pastor Huey mentioned it, every flag up here is from a nation that is represented in our congregation, and it's actually missing a few. So we are quite diverse, and I think when we get to heaven, it's going to look a lot like what we see in this room. But the story is, uh, Betty and I were invited uh, a couple of years ago, it's been about a year or two, to, to speak at the opening of a new Seventh-day Adventist church. And, and I've got some, some friends in that church and out at Oakwood. And as a matter of fact, one of, the, one of our worship singers is at that university. Uh, we went in and agreed to speak. And as we're standing there worshiping, I just looked around at the congregation and I noticed that Betty and I were the only ones with a light complexion. <laughs> you know, it didn't bother me at all. I mean, I, I was very comfortable. We were welcomed and loved on. It didn't even come up until I looked around and noticed it. And then I started looking around and I noticed that on the walls there were pictures of Jesus. But in every one of those pictures, Jesus was black. Again, it didn't bother me. And I think I've got a, a copy of one of those pictures. So I went ahead and spoke. And afterwards, a young brother came up to me. He's early 20s. He said, hey, Dr. Ray, I got a question for you. He said, what do you think? Do you think God is white or God is black? And I said, well, my brother, come over here and let's sit down. And I thought in my heart, man, I get to, I get to use a parable. <laughs> so we sat down and I said, let me tell you, it reminds me of there were two men. One was white and one was black. And they both loved God equally. They were best friends. As a matter of fact, they grew up together. They went to the same university. They got hired at the same place of employment. They would carpool to work every day. But there was one thing they couldn't agree on, if God was white or if God was black. And, of course, the white guy, God's white. Black guy, nope, he's black. And they, they would get in some pretty heated arguments. One day, they're, they're carpooling to work, and they got into such a heated argument that they crashed. 
the car, and both of them perished. Now, as they're going up to heaven, they're still arguing. Well, we're about to find out, aren't we? So, so they get up there, and they're standing in front of the gates, and the gates open up real slow, and there's this blinding light coming out of the gate. They could, they could hardly see. It was blinding. But within that light, they saw the silhouette of a man. And this silhouette of a man was approaching them slowly. And as he got close to them, he spoke. And this is what he said. Hola, como estas? <laughs> Actually, it was como estan? <laughs> I, we got Miriam in the back. She's like, no, that's not how he said it. Como están? How are y'all? <laughs> you know, a lot of folks, this is a day or, or a season where a lot of folks make a lot of New Year's resolutions, right? And many of these resolutions fail. Most of them do. And the reason for that is because they're based on man's will or, or on the, the individual's strength or willpower to make it through this resolution. And that's all temporary. You know, in fact, everything that's connected to man's efforts is temporary. Everything that is earthly and not spiritual is temporary. Only the Holy Spirit can change a person permanently. And when he changes, he changes your heart. That's where he starts. And when he changes your heart, that's when you receive the blessing. Today, I want you guys to join me in this coming year to make a resolution to let him change our heart. We have to let him. He's not going to force it on us. So I ask you to join me today to make that resolution. God, I will allow you to change my heart starting today. And God, I want you to put a strong desire in me to seek after and receive your blessings. So today's message is titled, Seeking and Receiving the Blessing. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up. I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 27, starting at verse 14. Genesis chapter 27, starting at verse 14. And it says, So Jacob went out and got the young goats for his mother. Rebekah took them and prepared a delicious meal, just the way Isaac liked it. Then she took Esau's favorite clothes, which were there in the house, and gave them to her younger son, Jacob. She covered his arms and the smooth part of his neck with the skin of the young goats. Then she gave Jacob the delicious meal, including freshly baked bread. So Jacob took the food to his father. My father, he said. Yes, my son, Isaac answered. Who are you, Esau or Jacob? And Jacob replied, It's Esau, your firstborn son. I've done as you told me. Here is the wild game. Now sit up and eat it so you can give me your blessing. And Isaac asked, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God put it in my path, Jacob replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come closer so I can touch you and make sure that you really are Esau. So Jacob went closer to his father and Isaac touched him. The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's, Isaac said. But he did not recognize Jacob because Jacob's hands felt hairy, just like Esau's. So Isaac prepared to bless Jacob. But are you really my son Esau, he asked. 
Yes, I am, Jacob replied. Then Isaac said, Now, my son, bring me the wild game. Let me eat it, and then I will give you my blessing. So Jacob took the food to his father, and Isaac ate it. He also drank the wine that Jacob served him. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come a little closer and kiss me, my son. So Jacob went over and kissed him. And when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he was finally convinced, and he blessed his son. Wow. You know, we can see here in this reading that, first of all, thank you, Father, for your word. We pray that that it would rest on our hearts and change us, that we would receive it for what you intend it to be for each one of us. Amen. You know, we see in this passage that Jacob was willing to do anything, almost anything, to receive his dad's blessing. He's willing to steal, to lie, to deceive. You know, Jacob pretended to be his brother, and he answered his dad and said, I am Esau. When he did that, he supplanted his brother. The name Jacob actually means one who supplants. To supplant means to take the place of another by force or by scheming or deception or some kind of strategy. It's purposeful. And it's not a good thing to supplant someone. Jacob was seeking the blessing above all things. But what exactly was that blessing? Was it the inheritance to receive from his father? I don't think it was because Jacob had already deceived his brother earlier into giving him the right to the firstborn's inheritance. So Jacob was practicing being the supplanter the deceiver while seeking his father's blessing. So what was that blessing? As we go a little further into this, it will become clear. But let's look at the definition of blessed because we need to understand what being blessed really means. And if we look in the English dictionary... Stick with me on this, all right, because the answer is here. But I want to show you something. The English dictionary says, blessed means to be made holy, consecrated, which means to be set apart and dedicated to serving God. Number two says, the second uh, definition says, endowed with divine favor and protection and bringing pleasure or relief as a welcome contrast to what one has previously experienced. You know, I got to admit that those definitions kind of surprised me because in our Western culture, that first one said to be made holy, right? In our Western culture, the most common meaning of being blessed usually refers to a good fortune, right? Good health, happiness, comfort, and material prosperity in this culture that we live in. That's what being blessed usually means. And in fact, i got to admit, I've used it that way myself many times. Oh, my, my daughter is, is so smart and such a good daughter. I am truly blessed. Don't get me wrong. All those earthly gifts that we, re- that we receive on earth, all the success, all the prosperity, the comfort, and the friendships that we enjoy, and the family that we have, they are all unmerited blessings from the Lord. David said, you are my master. Every good thing I have comes from you. And James said, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. So these undeserved blessings are from God's grace, and they're poured out on all His people. They should be received with thanksgiving 
and praise. They, they should lead us to find joy as we glorify God through them, through those blessings. However, in our flesh, these very blessings that we don't deserve sometimes result in attitudes of entitlement and pride. Those very blessings should cause us to seek Him even more, but instead we seek happiness in worldly circumstances. In the English dictionary, being blessed is not wealth or comfort. It means to be made holy. As followers of Jesus, we know that being made holy comes through salvation in Jesus Christ. That's how we are made holy. So the truest form of being blessed is to have a spirit-filled relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the truest form of being blessed by God. All those earthly blessings should pale in comparison to that. But they don't always, do they? Yeah, non-believers receive blessings as well, right? But not in the same way that we do. They're blessed through the common grace of God that extends to all people because all people should be dead. But He's holding back His wrath and He's blessing us that way, all people. The blessed circumstances of the non believers' lives. They're short-term gifts of God's grace rather than the life-giving, eternal blessings that are poured out on us. Amen. You know, what's tragic is that the comfort of these temporary blessings can blind many non-believers from their true state of spiritual poverty yeah. and, and their need for a Savior. Yeah. I'm thinking of a story when Betty and I were in another church back in Southern California, and it was in a very affluent neighborhood. We didn't live in that neighborhood. We, we just, we drove across the tracks and went to that church. And one day, one Sunday, our pastor asked us to go out in groups and go through the neighborhood evangelizing, door to door, handing out flyers to welcome people, to invite them to the church. And I remember me and a brother went up to one house. As we approached this house, there were, uh, I mean, I don't even know, they were Italian cars or French cars. I don't know what they were, but they were expensive cars. Parked in this driveway, there were several of them. And then parked beside the house in its own huge covering garage kind of thing was, was about an 80-foot boat. This house looked like a mansion, something you'd see in a Hollywood movie. And I said to my brother, man, this dude is really blessed. We walked up to the door and knocked, and he, it just so happened he was home, and he came to the door, and he was very friendly and welcoming, and he heard what we had to say very patiently, didn't say a word, and then when we were finished, he looked at me and said, Ray, what do I need to be saved from? Look around. I didn't know how to answer him. So I went back and prayed about it and, and got my study on in the Word to figure out how to answer him. But the point I'm making here is that the non-believers who are blessed materially don't even realize that they need a Savior. They don't even realize it. But Jesus said, blessed are those who are spiritually poor. In other words, he's saying, blessed are those who know they need a Savior. Do you know that you need a Savior? You're blessed. Listen to what Paul says about being blessed in Ephesians 1. He says, starting in verse 3, he says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us 
with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Down to verse 6. So we praise God for the glorious grace He has poured out on us who belong to His dear Son. Verse 8. He has, show, he has showered His kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Let me ask you a question. If God blesses all of His children, which Paul just said, then why does it seem like some are blessed and others are not? Why do some of His children live lives that are especially blessed and others do not? You know, it helps us to understand the answer to this question when we know the meaning of the original Greek word for blessed. It is... Makarios. This describes a believer as being in a position to receive God's favor. It's not a description of the result of being blessed. It's not really a past tense. It's, it's a preparatory word. So when you, when you see it in the, in the Greek, it means being prepared or being ready to be blessed. You see, we, we have to be ready. We have to be prepared to receive the blessing. And the best way I can explain that Makarios word is, what I have here is the blessing from God. This is His blessing. These represent His children. They're both believers. They're both his children. One of them is Makarios, prepared to receive the blessing. The other is not prepared to receive the blessing. But what God does, he pours his blessing equally on both of them. Makarios y salud. <laughs> Not prepared to receive the blessing, but it was poured out on them. This kind of helps me understand why some are evidently manifest his blessings more and deeper than others. You know, there are two parts to being blessed and living a blessed life. The first part is seeking the blessing. We saw earlier how Jacob sought after the blessing. The second part is receiving the blessing. Seeking and receiving are the two parts to being blessed. This position of being prepared to receive his favor, this makarios is a direct result of faith. The deeper your faith, the stronger your faith, the more makarios you will be. And, and for this, I should have, had another, should have had another container that was two or three times bigger than this and said, here is one with little faith and then show you the larger container here is one with much faith. The blessing increases with faith. I want to look at how that applies to us today. How can we seek and receive the blessing? This point of being prepared to receive the blessing it reminds me of another story. I like to tell stories. It's about the young boy who begged his mother to let him go to the local store with her. 
he promised to wash the dishes that night if she took him with her. You see, the boy had heard that the owner of that store always gave the kids free candy when they came to his store with their parents. When they entered the store, the owner held out a large jar of candy and invited the boy to help himself to a handful. Here you go. Have a handful. But the boy held back. He didn't reach in the jar. So the shop owner pulled out a handful for him and gave it to him. And when they got outside, the boy's mother asked why he had suddenly been so shy and wouldn't take a handful of the candy when it was offered to him. And the boy replied, because his hand is much bigger than mine. <laughs> You know, this story, it's a picture of how generous our God is. You know, we always receive more when we seek after the blessing and wait on Him instead of relying on our own efforts. When we seek the blessing and then are prepared to receive it, then our lives are changed. The seeking and receiving is crucial. But most people focus only on the blessing being given to them. You know, they watch for the blessing instead of actively actively seeking after it. Let me share the main sign that you are prepared to receive a blessing. This is how you know that you are makarios. You are seeking God with your whole heart. There it is. Seeking Him with your whole heart. And what does that mean? It means that we are learning to give Him our full attention. That's the only way I could encapsulate it into one statement. We're learning to give Him our full attention. Notice I said we're learning because it's a constant growth process. You know, often I find myself fixated on the blessing God gives me rather than seeking His presence. Or I get so immersed in doing things that I don't stop to ask for God's guidance. I just full steam ahead. You know, Brother Lawrence was a 17th century monk, and he was known for the practice of always living in a conscious awareness of God's presence. He said this, To arrive at union with God, all one needs is a heart resolutely determined to apply itself to nothing but Him. Do nothing but for His sake and to love Him only. You know, some, there's some things that we can start doing right now to seek Him. When you walk out of this building today, you can start praying continuously. You know, Brother Lawrence tried that. He woke up in the morning and said, I'm, I'm going to stay in contact with God all day long. And, and the book that he put out or that his autobiographer put out said that he lasted about six minutes that first day. Have you been there? <laughs> you know, sometimes I don't even think about him right off the bat. But when I do, it doesn't seem to last very long. I get distracted. So work on staying in contact with him continuously and be aware of his presence at, at all times. And instead of finding answers and solutions and peace in other things like the advice of a coworker or the emotional comfort of food or surfing the internet, first go to God to have our needs met. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and He will give you everything you need. Listen, when we seek God, there are three things we should remember. 
One is to approach God with an attitude of reverence. Remember that he's the creator of the universe. He knew you before you were even born. He is the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God, worthy of our praise. Number two, develop a humble and repentant heart. To be humble means that we know that he is God and we are not. We realize that he does not owe us a thing. And we don't deserve anything he does give us. Having a repentant heart means that we confess our sins to him regularly and we make a sincere effort to turn away from them. We can't stop sinning. It's in, it's in our human nature. But we can turn to him and ask for forgiveness. Amen. And make a sincere effort to turn away from that sin. Which brings me to the last point, which is to lean on God's grace. We got to stop striving to please God. You know, when I try really hard to love difficult people <laughs> or, or be more generous with my resources... I usually fail. What I've realized is that I was striving to do all those things without seeking God in the middle of it. The bottom line is most important thing we can remember when learning how to seek God with our whole hearts is to seek Him and Him alone. Then we'll be prepared to receive the blessing, the makarios. You know, a lot of us, including myself, we've sought after God for a long time, wanting something specific from Him in our life. And when we don't get what we're asking for, I get disappointed. And I kind of stop seeking after Him. I actually start thinking maybe He's just left me doesn't care about me or has abandoned me. But I, want, I'm, I want to tell you, if you feel that way, here's what I want you to think about. Now follow me on this. First, I want to look at a couple of verses to get us into what I want you to think about. Matthew 1.23 says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God is with us. And then Matthew 27, 46, at about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthiani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Remember those two verses. Why would he have said that? Would it have been better if he hadn't said that? Would it have been more fitting or more glorious if dying on the cross was easy for him? Well, that's the point. It cost him everything. It was the ultimate sacrifice, even for God. That makes it even more glorious. It shows us the love of God. But how could God be abandoned, forsaken? Remember, he was dying in our place. He became sin. We sang about that earlier. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin. He became sin. Who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He made himself the focal point of all judgment. So he had to be separated. It's part of judgment being separated from God. But here's, here's the paradox. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Who's crying out those words? God. The one crying out to God is God. God abandoned God. He's speaking those words in our place. The one asking why God is not with him is Emmanuel. God is with us. 
So what's significant about that? Well, because it means that when you come to the darkest moments of your life, when you feel that God has abandoned you, even then, God is with us. Oh. When you cry out those words, God, why have you forsaken me? God will be right there saying those words with you. When you feel far from God and separated from him, God will be there feeling just as far away and separated from God with you. God is with us. Even when God abandons us. My brain can't. It was God himself saying those words in our place. It means that even if you were abandoned by God, God would choose to be abandoned by God with you. Even if you were. Which really means that you'll never be abandoned. If God was with us even when he was separated from God, then there's nothing in this world or beyond it that will separate us from, from his love. He'll be with us always and forever. Paul understood this paradox when he said in Romans 8, Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm. God is with us. In closing, I want to go back and visit the life of Jacob real quick because we really didn't see the rest of the story. Remember when Jacob told his father that he was Esau? That's the moment that he became the supplanter. Right? That's the moment. By not confessing his real name, which was one who supplants, he actually became the supplanter. My brain can't. He received the blessing illicitly. A blessing intended for someone else. Follow me with this. So he never legitimately received it. He would spend the next part of his life struggling and striving and scheming. He had to go into hiding. He was in fear that his brother was going to kill him. Doesn't sound like a blessed brother to me. He was deceived by his uncle Laban. Remember, Laban had two daughters, Rachel and Leah. Jacob wanted to marry Rachel, and he agreed to work for Laban for seven years in exchange for Rachel's hand in marriage. You remember what happened? Leah supplanted her sister Rachel. Does that sound familiar? She deceived Jacob into marrying her instead of Rachel. So Jacob ended up working basically as Laban's slave for another seven years. Finally, he was able to escape Laban. And one night, Jacob came face to face with the truth. The night he wrestled with God and begged God to give him the blessing. This is how it went down. Genesis 32 22 through 30. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched... Oh, I missed something there. Do I have it on the screen? Let's go to the real source. My bad. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him 
until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I will not let you go seeking. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name, the man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. That night, Jacob was seeking the blessing, much like he sought his father's blessing years earlier. He was determined to receive it. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And it was then that God asked him, check this out, what is your name? Just like his father had asked him his name before he blessed him. But this time was different. This time he answered, I am Jacob, which he really was saying, I am the supplanter. But by coming as who he really was, Jacob the supplanter, he ceased to be Jacob the supplanter. And it was only then that God said, your name will no longer be Jacob. You are now Israel, which means wrestles with God. So only when Jacob comes as Jacob can Jacob cease to be Jacob and become Israel. And the blessing is then complete. You see, you can never be blessed by coming to God as what you are not. But only as what you are. Even when what you are is not what you were meant to be. God's not going to bless a false saint. But He will bless a real sinner. So if you're able to receive the blessing, you must come to Him as you are. With all your sins and failings, with no pretense or covering, then you'll be free and no longer bound to who you were. And your blessing will be given and your name, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. Jacob sought illegitimately to be blessed by a man, his earthly father, but it resulted in a life of bondage. Then Jacob sought to be blessed by a man, his heavenly father, and it resulted in glorious freedom. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for this example of Jacob's life showing us how seeking the blessing and then receiving the blessing is crucial. Help us, Lord, to keep our sight on you this year as we seek after the blessing. Help us to be prepared to receive it. We'll give you all the honor and all the glory. It's in your mighty Son's name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen, amen. Would you stand?